Good morning, everyone. I'm John Palfrey, and on behalf of the steering committee of the Digital Public Library of America, um, thank you all for being here. And um, most important, thank you to Doran and Peter and Lisbeth, the um, founding sponsors of the Digital Public Library. That was an announcement of $5 million for the next 18 months or so. If you didn't gather that, that was a pretty important thing that this group has just done. There are many things that are exciting about this effort, mostly, I think, the extraordinary uh, gathering of people from so many walks of life and places um, this morning gathered around the idea that attracts us. Um, but I think one central concept is important to note. There's a lot of talk in Washington and elsewhere about public-private partnerships, um, but it seems to me this is the embodiment of a really good one right here. Um, we just heard about $5 million on top of a previous million dollars in private capital being contributed to an ad hoc group of all of us, we are the DPLA, um, to work together in a way that we haven't before. Um, and that joins not just us as citizens of the United States and elsewhere, um, importantly, uh, international partners, as we'll hear later today, um, but also our federal government, which has, I think, in unprecedented ways, stepped up and said, yes, we want to participate in this slightly crazy thing, too. Um, and as the chair of the steering committee, I can say that I have been blown away by the extent to which our federal agencies and, frankly, state and local um, government agencies, too, have uh, held up their hands to say, let's uh, work together on this. From Carla Hayden in Baltimore and Peggy Rudd at the state level in Texas, the amazing realm of people uh, on our steering committee, uh, to the three people we are about to hear from now um, in this report from Washington. Um, I think I may have bought enough time for lavalier microphones to be on them. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to go down the line, and we'll hear in this report from Washington from three great friends, uh, in some ways three of the best friends of the Digital Public Library of America effort. Um, first, uh, Deanna Markham, the Associate Librarian of Congress. Um, we've heard reference already to the Library of Congress, which of course has a central role to play in uh, these efforts. For many years, they've been a leader in the digitization of our nation's cultural and scientific heritage. Um, I believe 28 million objects have already been digitized by the Library of Congress as uh, an important centerpiece in, I think, what we have to work with. But more important is the human capital that Deanna Markham herself and her team have brought to this effort. Um, Deanna, we love you deeply and are so grateful for all you've done uh, and look forward to hearing from you this morning. Thank you very much. Um, I want to make sure you can hear me. Is the sound okay? I guess it is. Is Lynn Brindley in the room? They're here. The, Hi, Lynn. I, I have to check to see if Lynn Brindley is in the room before I tell you the Library of Congress is the largest, most comprehensive library in the world with, uh, <laughs> you know, some, <laughs> there's some, <laughs> some debate about that. Um, but I'll say in, in America, how's that? Um, in the collection of the Library of Congress, there are 148 million items. We have digitized 28 million of those. And I, I liked Peter's comment so much about uh, moving from boutique to the Walmart model, because I think what this initiative allows is even though we've digitized a lot of material, um, it isn't enough to be a um, the kind of digital resource that we all believe is important for the country. So we see this as an opportunity to expand and enhance the work we've already done. I'm, um, I'm filling in today for James Billington, the Librarian of Congress, and if he were here, um, I think he would want you to know a little bit more about what we've done already, and then we can talk together about how we can leverage what we've done to, to meet these needs. The, the mission of the Library of Congress is to support Congress in fulfilling its constitutional duties and to further the progress of knowledge and creativity for the benefit of the American people. It's not unlike the NEH mission, it's not unlike the missions you'll hear about here. The, the point is what we are concerned about is making these resources that have been amassed at a great institution 
by tax dollars from American citizens, and we want to make that as available as possible. So that is what brings us to the table of the Digital Public Library of America, because it, it appears to be the kind of opportunity that will help us fulfill our mission in, in a very important way. So um, let me just go into a little detail about what we have done. We have a long history of building digital collections. Um, it began when in 1987, Dr. Billington was appointed Librarian of Congress. He went on a tour of the country and he held um, uh, town hall meetings, for lack of a better word, in 10 locations throughout the country. And he asked, what do you want from the Library of Congress? He met with teachers, librarians, uh, faculty in universities, and pretty much uh, the answer was uniformly the same. Um, we want your content and we want it where we are, not where you are. <clears throat> and he took that to heart. And he came back to the Library of Congress with the notion that uh, what we must do is make our content more widely accessible. Well, the internet hadn't been invented by Al Gore or anyone else yet, <laughs> so uh, we looked to CD-ROM technology to get content out, and we began digitizing collections in the uh, very early 1990s. And we focused on materials that would be useful to the K-12 community because we thought that's where the greatest need was. So um, we were sending CD-ROMs <laughs> to schools and to libraries, and then we went, uh, we went back to those. We had 44 pilot institutions, and we went back to all of them to find out how they were using the content so we could understand better uh, what else we should try to digitize. Well, what was amazing to everyone involved is that and we thought this would be most useful to high school students. <clears throat> In fact, all the way down to third grade, uh, students were making incredibly innovative uses of this digital content. And we saw that uh, even with this clunky CD-ROM method, um, students were beginning to ask important questions about their history <clears throat> and about the world. So we um, committed to making more and more of our primary source materials available to schools and libraries around the country. In 1995, Congress um, talked with the Library of Congress about this uh, digitization effort and said, if you will raise private money, we'll put up some money. <clears throat> and there was um, a three to one match, three, to, three part private, one part Congress. But that really allowed us to expand enormously our digitization efforts. <clears throat> Thank you, I, I agree, thank you. We realized that um, we had special collections that were held nowhere else in the country. We had um, manuscripts and music and maps and films and all kinds of things. So we began to focus on digitizing those special collections materials rather than books. We were visited by Google when, um, the, when Google began to digitize collections. We decided that our, our focus would be on special formats and we did a little bit of experimenting with Google, but in the end, we stayed with our primary focus. 
But more recently, uh, we've, we've begun to think far more broadly about what from our collections should be readily accessible to the American people. And we were so pleased when the Sloan Foundation agreed to fund a digitization project that would allow us to identify uh, public domain books in our general collections and make those available through our website as well. <clears throat> we were uh, funded for two years by the Sloan Foundation and we've been able to continue <clears throat> the book's digitization effort with our own funds, but we are systematically going through our American history, local history, and genealogy collections and putting those online as well. <clears throat> so before I lose my voice, I will stop by saying uh, we think that the resources that are represented in the federal agencies is a wonderful foundation for the Digital Public Library of America. We, <coughs> excuse me, we are so anxious to make our collections available. And we, we've worked with the National Archives, with the Smithsonian, we've worked closely with IMLS, um, we very much look forward to working with everyone who has contributions to make to this important effort. Thank you. <laughs> Dana, thank you so much and thank you to Dr. Billington um, in absentia for your leadership and for your offers of support and in fact your actual support yep. on this effort. Um, we will see later this afternoon uh, a treat which is um, examples from the Baydust Brint. Uh, there are going to be six uh, large-scale presentations and then three lightning uh, round presentations. One of them is entitled Digital Collaboration for America's National Collections, which joins the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, and the National Archives. Um, I understand that it's not always the case that three, these three <laughs> agencies, uh, all right, we're coming to the National Archivist. But, it is um, now. It is, it is now. now. So anyway, we're, we're very grateful for that and for all that you've done and all that you will do, I have no doubt. Thank you. Um, our second report from Washington is from another great friend of the DPLA, Susan Hildreth. Um, Susan has a long background um, directing important iconic libraries in the United States, has <coughs> been a champion um, through this project of uh, all manner of public libraries, including uh, small, special, and rural libraries in uh, many respects uh, helped us to identify um, Dwight McInvale, our newest member of the steering committee from the Georgetown County Library in South Carolina. Um, and Susan is currently, um, as everyone knows, I think the director of the IMLS, which um, is uh, in many respects uh, yet another piece of the amazing foundation that supports museums and libraries um, and the digitization effort. And Susan, you've been uh, an amazing participant and thank you for being here and we look forward to your report as well. Well, thank you, John. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. You know, um, I think in this uh, rarefied audience, uh, possibly everybody here may know what IMLS is, but just to make sure, <coughs> I'm gonna review just a little bit about what we do. We're the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and we are a federal agency, an executive agency, that is primarily responsible for grant making. So we, distrib we distribute the federal dollars for libraries and museums in the United States, but as, as time has moved on, we're a fairly young agency. We were only established in the late 1990s. We've taken on some other roles, particularly data collection, evaluation, policy development, and really leadership in the field. So when you think about the role we play with our federal partners, Library of Congress, Archives, Smithsonian, they have great content. IMLS does not have content, but we have great access to our nation's museums and libraries and we provide a wonderful distribution network to um, the on-ramp to our digital library highway, if you will. So we're really excited to be part of this <coughs> adventure, uh, which we're all on. So again, I'd like to thank uh, the Berkman uh, Center for Internet and Society, our wonderful funders, the Sloan Foundation, as well as Arcadia, and we're very happy to be here today. I think um, some of the key issues we're discussing today uh, and in the future, or what should this DPL ba DPLA be? And I think we're, we've made great progress, we'll continue to do so. Who really can 
participate? How can you participate? How will, be it, how will it be sustained as a public resource? But um, from the IMLS point of view and from all the work many of us have done, I have another question for us to think about today, and that is which products of the previous 20 years of work can we use in constructing a digital public library of America and what still needs to be created? Now, this is a key interest for IMLS. I'll explain that we've made a number of investments in digitization all around our nation, and um, we do have some federal resources, <coughs> diminishing as they may be, we <laughs> want to use them very strategically, and we really are very interested in how DPLA is moving forward so we can make strategic investments to support the digit digitization efforts that we need to move forward. Um, I think as you've heard a little bit today from Deanna, uh, I'll just mention that early in the 1990s, federal agencies, including the Library of Congress and the National Science Foundation, began strongly and visibly supporting digitization and digital library research development and demonstration projects. And we know that in the years that followed, other federal, state, and private funders joined in supporting these efforts. And in the mid-1990s, the newly created IMLS joined the effort with our first digitization project grant awards in 1998. And in the years since, our agency's range of digital library investments has, has expanded dramatically. Some of the things we've been doing include hundreds of digitization projects, ranging from the more specialized and focused content to mass digitization of library and archives collections, and a great partnership with the University of Illinois to aggregate metadata so users can more easily discover these collections. You'll see that in one of the, the clear beta sprint project this afternoon. We have been building projects. We've been funding projects building tools that enhance how people create, use, manage, and preserve digital content. We have supported the advance of digital libraries such as the ongoing multi-partner project managed at the University of Michigan documenting title by title copyright status of more than 500,000 books published in the US, 1923 to 63. We have supported collaborations at all levels with a wide variety of partners, and particularly of note the statewide digitization projects that are now existence in more than 40 states. Uh, we've applied, we've developed applied research ranging from the examination of the online information seeking behavior of teens to investigations of the best methods for preserving instructional video games. We are also committed to training a high class quality workforce who can become our digital uh, navigators of the 21st century. And as you all know, um, I think our library schools, although they're doing a great job in moving us forward, need some additional assistance in developing 21st century digitally um, competent librarians, and that's a key role for IMLS. Um, we also are providing support for national conversations, um, important to the future of digital libraries. A good example is an upcoming meeting of invited experts and leaders to help map out a blueprint for the public library's role in the emerging, emerging Digital Public Library of America. We're going to be holding that in Los Angeles in mid-November at the Los Angeles Public Library, thanks to the uh, work and the collaboration of Martin Go Gomez, City Librarian. So these ongoing and early investments by IMLS and other sp sponsors, both public and private, have advanced digital library practice in ways that might not have been possible without such coordinated and sustained support. So here we are, what is our next step? I think we're at a critical point of moving forward in this world, and what kinds of new organizations do we need to provide the services that have been provided previously? Um, I think we want to recognize that we have a lot of information available for our designers and builders of DPLA to develop their efforts on. We have developed a critical mass of born digital and retrospectively digitized collections already. We have many elements of existing digital library infrastructure. We have developed systems and tools, models, standards, best practices and policies. And I think fortunately we have organizations, many of whom are here today, who are willing to build, maintain, and monitor and support these digital collections. Uh, but one other resource that we have that's available to all of us to help jumpstart the DPLA is that we have the record, and I'm sure the archives has much of this, 
of journals, conference proceedings, planning documents, reports of 20 years of a national and international discussion on what digital libraries should be, who can participate, and how they can be sustained. Those same questions that are facing us today. And just from the IMLS point of view, where we have invested in a rather disaggregated uh, effort all across the country, and we would really like to have our efforts be sustainable and also available to be evaluated and have the impact on our users shown, we just have a couple of lessons uh, learned that we wanted to share with all of you. First of all, in digitization, it's difficult to go it alone. Don't go it alone. Collaboration is key to long-term success, and I can see all of us gathered here today are really uh, demonstrating that. The traditional understanding of the relationship between information providers and consumers is changing, and both can benefit from working together in new ways. Digital libraries have clearly demonstrated their potential to reduce administrative, technical, and other barriers to information access, something that we're all being asked to do constantly, particularly with limited resources. But we still have a long way to go in seeing the fullest realization of their potential to transform how libraries, archives, and museums function, who they serve, how those individuals are served, and ultimately, how can they transform individuals and community lives. Um, we also want to make sure that we <coughs> follow some of the key principles that we've been following at IMLS. We try to make sure all our grantees follow interoption, interoperability, which is critical, and preservation of digital information resources. We had a great discussion about that yesterday in some of our grouping, working groups about persistence and how if someone is involved in DPLA, we must have the responsibility to take care of that data. That's a huge concern of everyone here. We want to make sure we ad address rights for access and the use of content, make sure our programs and services are sustainable, and find new ways to measure the impact to our public. And I think another big question we're dealing with is, this all sounds great, but what is the difference going to be for a person who's going on the web and wants to find information? And I know we can find the answers to that question. I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm particularly pleased because I hope that IMLS can be very strategic in supporting our efforts in the future. Thank you. Susan, thank you. <laughs> if I might briefly just draw out two themes that you mentioned, Susan. Um, one is one way in which I think the uh, entire DPLA project can be successful is not just if it brings um, support into a single um, secretariat or kind of central force, but in fact if it creates a platform that allows for better coordination of the funding that you and many others are doing into libraries all across the country and other kinds of institutions that are a part of this. And that if what we merely do is do more with what we are already doing and coordinate better, um, I think we will have succeeded in a part. I think we can do much more than that, but I think that's a very important uh, initial concept. Um, and second, you mentioned the um, uh, excitement and the possibilities of having a new crowd of librarians who are coming up through library schools. Um, the archivist mentioned that um, our friends at Simmons in Boston have a room set aside where people right now are watching this being streamed to Simmons. Uh, I think we should give them a, a special <laughs> hello again. Um, but I can say that in, since we've started this process, the number of library students and the number of uh, people in library schools who have also raised their hand and said, we want to participate, let's figure this out. It's very, very encouraging and exciting, um, and thank you for supporting uh, that effort as well. Um, so the last uh, report from Washington is from a man who truly does need no introduction, particularly in this house, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, this is uh, in David uh, Ferriero, the archivist of the United States. We have uh, an amazing leader who is now um, uh, leading this institution that we're in. He comes from uh, the New York Public Library, where he was the Mellon director of the New York Public Libraries, and uh, before that, uh, director of the MIT Libraries and Duke. Um, this is someone who has been a friend in every possible way to the effort that I think is coming together and coalescing today. It's extremely fitting that you are our host today, uh, Mr. Ferriero, and thank you so much for all you've done, and um, we're uh, very much looking forward to your particular report from Washington as well. Well, before I start, Susan, um, have your records been scheduled? Yes, they have. We're working with you. So why do you, right why now. do you have 20 years sitting over there? <laughs> uh oh, I'm in trouble now. Okay, that's one to do. The other is Brewster. Get your bank details to Peter. And, uh, yeah. See, we're making progress. This is great. So how many of you? For how many of you is this your first visit to this building? 
as I expected. So I need to tell you who we are because we're the best kept secret in town. Um, the National Archives is the nation's record keeper. That means we're responsible for all the records of the 275 federal agencies and the White House. And we provide courtesy storage for all the records of Congress. We opened our doors in 1935. It was um, um, FDR described this as his baby. He was very much involved in the planning of the National Archives. So it's amazing that what we have in terms of records before 1935 have survived. Exposed to fire, theft, flood, all kinds of um, horrible, horrible situations. Wonderful story of records being stored in the um, garage at the White House during the Hayes administration and Rutherford B. Hayes himself outside on the lawn with, in a fire brigade um, putting out the fire uh, in the White House garage. We have records that start with the Continental Congress, um, the Oaths of Allegiance signed at Valley Forge, all the way up to the tweets that are being created in the White House as we sit here today. That's our mandate. We have 44 facilities around the country, from Anchorage, Alaska to Atlanta, Georgia, and um, I love this debate between uh, Library of Congress and British Library about size. Get over it. <laughs> um, <laughs> We have 12 billion pages of, of textual records, 40 million photographs, 600,000 600, artifacts in the presidential libraries, um, and the growing, the, the largest growing collection, of course, electronic content, billions of electronic records uh, right now in our custody. The, the Presidential Records Act, which is one of the, the um, sets of laws that govern my work, recognized electronic mail in 1996. So we started collecting email from the Reagan administration. We have eight million email messages from that administration, 20 million from the Clinton administration, and 210 million from the George W. Bush administration. And as the president likes to tell me when I see him in Dallas, not one of those is mine. <laughs> <laughs> So our customers are researchers, genealogists, veterans, the, the general public, Congress, and the White House, using our records all the time. And I have a, an ulterior motive. My, my reason for being so passionate about the digital library is that I want every stinking piece of this collection digitized. I want it available to the world 24 <laughs> hours a day. And as you heard from John, I've been in this business for a long time, and I can still remember at Duke University, faculty members coming to me complaining because their students <coughs> were doing all their research online. And I can remember discussions with my librarians about how are we going to get them to use the paper materials. <laughs> get over it. What can we do to get that stuff digitized? How, how can we facilitate the creation of it? Because I am convinced if it's not online, it doesn't exist. So instead of fighting it, how can we make that happen? And that's why I'm so, so interested in, in this project. So let me tell you a little bit about of that massive amount of, of material that we have. We have done such a small fraction of, of that content. We have uh, established commercial partnerships with uh, Ancestry.com and FamilySearch, since genealogists are, are one of our biggest markets. And we've done a very small percentage of passenger lists, um, pension files, um, Civil War, Revolutionary War records to, um, to get that material in people's hands. But the, the, um, the massive amount of material that we have to do um, uh, has caused us to be rather creative in ways of creating new kinds of opportunities. Some of you may have seen the Citizen Archivist program that um, has been launched through the National Archives, the new dashboard. Is it up? Uh, yeah, it will be up soon. Okay, soon you'll see the dashboard giving uh, opportunities for the people to get involved in helping us process our <laughs> records. We also are using them to help digitize our records. We have a Civil War Conservation Corps upstairs in this very building working on, these are retirees who are working, not from the Civil War, 
Um, <laughs> who are working on Civil War records, preparing them for digitization. We've got something called Docs Teach, which is up now, has about uh, 5,000 of our primary sources that are uh, loaded with lesson plans and a uh, facility for teachers to talk to each other, uh, share lesson plans, and, and share uses of uh, material. So we're trying in all different kinds of angles to make as much of our content um, uh, available as possible. That, uh, as I said, the reason I'm so interested in this. But it's also, I think, um, I want to give you a concrete example of the power of this kind of uh, digital collection. Uh, I was at the New York Public Library for five years. Um, when I was being interviewed, I had to sign a non-disclosure statement so that Paul LeClaire, the president, could talk to me about the Google Book Project. So I spent five years working with Google. We digitized about a million books, um, public domain, from the New York Public Library collection. And I saw, um, slowly saw, the power of researchers having access to that broad body of information and how it has already transformed scholarship. So I have um, a wonderful in-house story uh, about Google Books. In December 2009, the president issued an executive order creating the National Declassification Center here at the National Archives, which gave me the mandate to review 400 million pages of classified content with the mandate to release as much as possible only two criteria, weapons of mass destruction and national security could be used to keep them classified. So it's a process that we have launched working with the agencies who have equities in the, in the content. And we review, we've reviewed about um, over a million pages now and, and have released, um, of, of those that have gone through the full analysis, have released 91% to the open shelves. So we're making great progress. The oldest, these, and these records go back to World War I, 1917. And in April, I am so pleased that the CIA finally caved on the six oldest documents. Mm. Six documents of, they were German formulas for secret ink, <laughs> which had been foiled forever. People have been trying to get at these. Leon Panetta, before he left the CIA, big press conference announcing the fact that he's, re he's releasing these documents. What he didn't say is that he released them because my staff used Google Books and discovered that these formulas had been published in 1931. <laughs> 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 that's what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Another of the amazingly exciting things I think that lie ahead um, are the many different use cases and stories that we'll hear about, I think, of precisely that sort. I think it's not at all surprising this room is filled not just with um, librarians and those of us who are in the information business, but professional historians in Professor Darnton and Professor Baldwin and Professor Schnapp and lots of people here who are historians and researchers who are here because I think there's a sense of opportunity, not just for democracy, but for specific projects and specific research that we simply can't do today, but that we will be able to do before too long. <coughs> Another auspicious sign, I think, of this project is um, speakers have kept to their time. So we actually have some time for um, some discussion in this uh, report from Washington. There are microphones on either side over here and some great friends from the Berkman Center who I'm sure will run them around um, if people don't want to go from the middle uh, to, the, uh, um, uh, to come have a comment. I would remind you that we are in an august place and you are being recorded and this is no doubt going to be kept for history so I'd be grateful if you would keep the questions for our speakers very And clean. I neglected to say for those of you who haven't been here before, you need to carve out some time to get up into the rotunda to see the Declaration, the, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. The public vaults that surround the rotunda have samples of records from the archives. And in the special gallery, there is a wonderful exhibit called What's Cooking Uncle Sam? And it's about the government's role in telling you what to eat. <laughs> Very good. I can't help while people are hopefully thinking of their question of um, acknowledging my mother who's here today, Judy Palfrey. <laughs> um, I'm doing that. I'm doing that because it relates to Let's, um, this food exhibit. She's in charge of the First Lady's Let's Move initiative. Oh, um, great. To get people uh, to be 
um, fitter, both through Very activity good. and through their eating. And so I noticed yeah. the obvious connection between the archives. And actually, I know IMLS is doing much on this yeah. issue yeah. as well. So I'm hoping to drag her into the digital library's <laughs> world um, <laughs> by inviting her to the archives. Um, all right, there must be a question by now. I have no other relatives to announce in the audience. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, please, thank you. And may I, I'd love to privilege Bob Darden if you would take us a next question. You must have something that we could put the mic in front of you for. Uh, hi, yeah, um, I'm, I'm Mick Koo from Drexel. And um, uh, in, in, in the presentations, we've heard a lot about accessibility and so on. Um, I just wondered if you would speak to the difference between accessibility and discoverability, because I think there are different technical challenges with putting stuff online versus been able to find stuff in the stuff once it's online. <laughs> it's terribly important, of course, and you're looking at three people who don't uh, know how to do that. <laughs> 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 The reason no. you are here well, you may not is know. that we need to work <laughs> with you. <laughs> Public-private partnership. <laughs> there, uh, it depends on how you de de define um, discoverability. One of the things that Josh Greenberg, not to point, single him out, taught me when, um, when he came to the New York Public Library was we have a, a horrible history of building these digital libraries and then expecting people to find us. So yeah. let's think about where are the people um, and let's get our stuff out there. Um, so uh, convincing us to use you know, YouTube and, and Flickr and those kinds of things to get our content into the <laughs> eyes of people so that they can discover. Uh, it's a huge problem for me here because our records are so massive and complex and the, 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 the thing that uh, a new learning uh, experience here is that kids today can't read cursive and all of my old records you know, are in cursive. So one of the wonderful things on the dashboard that you'll see is an opportunity for you to help us transcribe. And last week I transcribed my first document. <laughs> so I just wanted to address accessibility. I think in your question, when, when you speak about accessibility, you're talking about making material available to be um, seen or identified. But I also think accessibility is a much broader issue in terms of making the great content we have available to all kinds of individuals with accessibility challenges. And those could be uh, visually impaired, it could be langu language challenges. So, so accessibility, I think, um, universal accessibility is really important. Um, but I totally agree with you that if you have a lot of stuff out there and nobody can find it, what is the use of it? So I think one of the things that IMLS is very interested in supporting is different strategies, platforms, approaches to effective discovery. And I mean, there are many other entities in Washington and even privately that would be willing to support development of those kinds of platforms or strategies. But um, I mean, that, that is a very good example for me, you know, better discovery tools of how IMLS could help use your federal dollars to support this initiative. But I would just like to echo, um, I think we haven't talked all that much about accessibility here, but I am assuming, and I'll speak for the audience, that I think it's a key priority that all of our information is uh, available in many different formats to many different individuals. And there's another, there's another aspect of this that, uh, this was a lesson I learned at MIT that, uh, around serendipity. And how do we make it possible for people to have that same serendipity experience because that's where discoveries come from um, online. We'll bring a mic around, but Professor Darton, in the meantime, if you would, our... Uh, no, I, I would like to hand the microphone back to you, John. I see, <laughs> all right. Well, there's someone, uh, I would like to pass it this way, actually, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nancy Gwen. I'm the director of the Smithsonian Institution Libraries. And I just wanted to, um, since the Smithsonian was mentioned uh, as one of the three agencies who are trying to develop, I just wanted to mention to the audience that we also are very interested in uh, participating in the DPLA uh, with our um, 
137 million objects, since we're talking numbers today. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good kind of competition, right? Federal yeah, agencies absolutely. competing on how much they can contribute. Well, I have to follow that up by saying 124 million of them are natural history specimens. So <laughs> right. how many mosquitoes we want to have in the DPLA is, uh, is a question. You tell us, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> but we also, and I think you have seen in the press that uh, Secretary Wayne Clough has said that he also uh, wants to share the Smithsonian's riches with the nation and the world in many ways, and uh, we already have 6.4 million digitized objects and are trying to go forward as fast as we can. So we're in a kind of unique position to pull in uh, museum, library, and archives objects together and to help uh, figure out how that best can be done for the DPLA and, and for the nation. So I, um, I'm eager to uh, continue to cooperate and work in this and uh, uh, share our riches with all of you. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you to Secretary Clough, who I knew would have been here today, but for a, a Board of Trustees meeting of uh, extraordinary minor conflict, details. Yeah, minor yeah. details. Um, we've had extraordinary support from your colleague, also uh, Martin, who's chairing the technical aspects work stream. So the Smithsonian has been very actively involved, and we look forward to much more to come as we uh, digitize <coughs> those insect, insects and other good things. Um, who else? This cannot be a quiet crowd. It seems implausible. Please. Yes. My name is Lindsay Lynn. Ashby, and I'm. Um, I have a question about your statement regarding the CIA documents that were disclosed. Um, my brother and I have had frequent conversations. He works for Raytheon and does um, rocket scientist work for um, the military. And he and I have had in many conversations about reverse engineering and the dangers of that, so in his field, that. And I was curious about you know, the disclosure of um, you know, the release of certain CIA documents and if there are any mechanisms in place to sort of monitor that. Um, to kind of avoid those sort of reverse intelligence, I guess, in this case. I, I don't want to give the impression that the Archivist of the United States has the authority to release. The authority given to me in that executive order is to get the agencies that hold the equities around the table to review the content to ensure that it really is classified. So it was the CIA who released it, not the National Archives. So I just facilitated the process. Okay. Do you anticipate more? I guess I don't want to use the word. Well, we, as I said, we've <laughs> done a million so far. There are 400 million in this body, and it has to be done by December 31st, 2013. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I should also tell you, in this room, we had two open forums for the public to come and advise us on which records are of most interest. This is a, a, you know, just so we could get some citizen participation in helping us prioritize. And I hosted both of those meetings, and <laughs> the room was evenly split. In both cases, the Kennedy assassination conspiracy, <laughs> UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh, yes, please. Um, let's look, actually, uh, Jordan, can we go with John Mayer, since he, some, he has not yet spoken, and then you'll get next. And Lynn, Lynn Brindley has oh, a question too. Excellent. Oh, excellent. Oh, fantastic. Well, actually, let's, as the mic's coming across, name Lynn Brindley. Um, please tell, um, the, we know who you are, but please tell the world. Well, Don, as you've uh, mentioned the British Library, here I am, and I'm <laughs> delighted to be here today, and I'm not even going to get into arguments about size. <laughs> um, I mean, there, uh, there are disadvantages of scale, of course. It's like turning a very big oil tanker in whatever direction you want to go, and it's always too slow. So uh, for those of you who have small and agile institutions, sometimes that can be a very major advantage. Um, first of all, I'm really delighted to be here and thank you, Bob, for inviting me. Uh, it happened to coincide with a visit to the States. So I was really delighted to be able to stay on to be here today. Um, like the Library of Congress, we're a library we say of the world and for the world, so we share absolutely your aspiration to open up our great collections of all cultures in all languages um, to the world. We've digitized a lot, but it's a drop in the ocean. I would say we've got quite a lot of boutiques. They're mostly, we've got shops within shops, but they're all disconnected. They're opportunistic. 
uh, in the most positive way, but nevertheless don't make a digital library. And I think one of the real challenges is what is the difference between a digital library uh, and, um, and, a, and a wonderful um, but confusing uh, and, if you like, random set of resources. And I think that's one of the challenges that you and we need to face. Um, I think public-private partnerships have been mentioned. I think we uh, in the UK, because of our uh, history, are very much into public-private partnerships for these things. Um, uh, but we do have, and you will hear from Jill Cousins, who I noticed is sort of at the back there, on Europeana, we have got some coherence being brought in the European context um, through the European Library, which will be a sort of aggregator of libraries of Europe, research libraries um, and national libraries, into the broader <coughs> cultural museum library and archive service, which is Europeana. Can I also mention metadata? We have just um, opened up all of our metadata on a CC0 license, which means Uh, it was a braver step than you perhaps might imagine, <laughs> um, in part because we have a particular government that requires me to earn money. That's not always a comfortable place to be. So we said, well, we don't think that's quite right for this. So we've opened up the 16 million of our metadata of our national bibliography to the world for any purpose. And we have got hackathons and mashups and everything happening in the most extraordinary way. So I suppose another lesson is um, you have no idea what this is going to be used for. Right. You can't plan for it, um, and it will be infinitely more creative um, the wider this thing gets opened up. So I think metadata is actually a key part or a key consideration of this. I think also we've done a lot of work and we're beginning a long journey on what we label, it's the wrong label, I think, but <coughs> digital curators, uh, modern curators, modern library professionals. I think that's probably a challenge we all share. Uh, and people who are as comfortable with large data sets, text mining, data mining, all of those things, as with perhaps our traditional um, services. So I could give you many examples of what we've digitized. There's much <coughs> more to go. Um, and we intend to go as fast as we can from a variety of sources. It's often said that um, perhaps the UK is the bridgehead between North America and um, mainland Europe. Um, I would like to suggest that we're probably a good stopping off point. Uh, and if there are opportunities perhaps in this program, we would be delighted to host something uh, in London at the British Library. Uh, as you take this journey forward. So we're part of the journey with you and we're delighted, I'm delighted to be here with you today. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. <laughs> Dame Lynn Brindley, we will take you up on that kind offer to host an event, no doubt, at your <laughs> house as well. Um, I should note that one other thing you didn't uh, brag about but should have in a way is th uh, the, some of the research coming out of the British Library in terms of how young people use information is some of the best research I think that we have. And one of the reasons I think you have that serendipity and those wonderful things is you've come to understand this concept of generativity, that if we make available these tools and metadata and, and content, people will do, young people and older people too, amazing things with it. So thank you for that leadership as well. Um, great, so I'm gonna go to John Mayer and then uh, Bob Darton and Doran and then we'll take a break. My name is John Mayer from the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. I want you to use your imagination. So it's 2016 and all of your collections have been digitized. I'm assuming this will only take five years, of course. <laughs> And I've heard an awful lot of excitement for that process and for the science and how we're going to do that, and I'm excited too. But what, what does society get? How does society improve or change once that's in place and has happened? What's the, what's the science fiction of, of, this, uh, of the DPLA? Well, I, I can speak for myself. I, um, 
if we assume, and I think most of us in this room do, that uh, people benefit from having access to information resources. They can make better decisions for themselves. They can understand where they've come from and possibly a better direction of where they're going. They can understand world cultures. They can understand uh, the questions they have about you know, any number of things. I think what we've all been trying to do by collecting these resources is making sure they are available to people who want to use them in any way they, they want. Um, it's what we've always talked about in libraries for the whole, my whole career. We've talked about wanting to get these materials out to people. We finally have a mechanism for doing that. And I don't know that, um, for me, that it's any more than that, just making it available. Most of the resources in our public institutions are there because Americans have paid for them. And it seems only right to share them. For me, it's um, creating a better informed citizenry. The records here um, should be used to hold our government accountable for their actions and for us to be able to understand our history. That statue outside passed his prologue. We should be learning from our history. And the only way you can do that is to have access to the records and people don't have that kind of access right now. So I'm hoping that we create a more informed citizenry in this process. I personally think um, it's an amazing opportunity, as my colleagues have echoed. Um, I also think that if <coughs> everything is digitized, I think as a, as a practicing public librarian, the question comes to mind, well, what happens to our physical facilities? Uh, even if we may be aggregating and curating data for our customers, do we still have, do we still have a place uh, for people to gather? And I think that by providing all that information and providing the empowerment of that information to our citizens, it will even create a greater need and a greater desire for people to work together. As we've heard from the British Library, the stuff is out there, all kinds of mashups are happening, and people may be relating in the virtual world and in the physical world, but but I think it's a very exciting and liberating future for our uh, communities and citizens. I think the other question I have, and this is kind of wearing another hat, um, is you know, if we're gonna have all this data out there, we must have connectivity to homes and libraries and schools, strong connectivity, thank you, Gates Foundation. <laughs> but we're gonna really need it, and, and I think that uh, the more we make this rich content available, people will understand and, and adopt because they want to be there too. They want to know what's happening along with everybody else. So I, I think it's a great hallmark for the future. Thank you, Susan. Last word is going to go to Robert Darden. I did want to acknowledge Jill Nishi and her colleague Nelson Cruz from the Gates Foundation, who were the ones just thanked there for a lot of the connectivity <laughs> to American uh, libraries. I think that, was, that is an amazing piece of this infrastructure of ideas, I think, that uh, Chairman Leach uh, mentioned mm -hmm. before. Bob Darden, last word. Well, it's not at all the last word. For this uh, session, until a break. <laughs> we've had a question session, but you may have noticed that a lot of it has taken the form of testimonials. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's wonderful to see the support expressed from the Smithsonian as well as from these three institutions represented on stage. And it's great that Dame Lynn Brindley has just invited us all to London. <laughs> <laughs> we accept. Th <laughs> thank you very much. And but graphic she, artists, I hope there's some great drawings of our trip <laughs> that are coming up here on these boards. Uh, the point I want to make, though, is that when we considered what we should name this thing, one of the suggestions was a national digital library, and it was rejected because this is there's nothing nationalistic about this at all. We may go from what uh, Lynn Brindley calls the boutique phase to what Peter Baldwin calls the Walmart phase, getting bigger and so on. But getting bigger means getting more international. And that is certainly going to happen. I should say that uh, Bruno Racine, the uh, director of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, wanted to be here, says 
I can't speak for him, but he says he is with us. We have uh, Jill Cousins representing Europeana and the 27 countries that furnish this great European digital library. It's an international effort. So these expressions of support from lots of different US institutions, as well as everyone scattered around the country, especially in public libraries in small towns, what this represents, I think, is a movement, a movement that has nothing nationalistic about it, but that goes back to the international republic of letters that was dreamt of in the period of enlightenment. So I hope that we're getting this feeling that we can actually make happen what was a utopian dream at the founding of this country. That sounds a little pious. I apologize, but I couldn't resist. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I hope you will join me uh, first in thanking the panel, but also thanking uh, Professor Darton, who I think also deserves an additional round of applause for his leadership, uh, intellectual and otherwise, in this effort. Um, we've had an amazing, amazing group um, come together and will come together. So thank you, panelists. Thank you, Professor Darnton, and all others. Thank you.